What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Instagram at talklouder underscore podcast, and our website, talklouderpodcast.com. I'm Metal Dave, along with my co-host Jason McMaster, and today we have Mickey Finn on the show. Mickey Finn, best known as the singer for Jet Boy. Uh, you'll remember Jet Boy, their song was Feel the Shake. That's the one that got the radio play in the late 80s. Uh, they did a follow-up album called Damnation, which was kind of overlooked, but a really great record. Um, and uh, there was a time when uh, Jet Boy, Poison, and Guns N' Roses were the three biggest bands in California as far as the record labels were concerned. They were all sniffing around uh, at the same time, and Jet Boy was in the running. Um, and then we'll let Mickey tell the story, but there's a lot of the usual mismanagement, bad business, bad timing, bad luck, et cetera. Uh, but we're happy to have him on the show today. You'll find out he's a high-energy dude. Yes, he is. Great stories. <laughs> yes, he is high energy, but uh, super fun and yeah. excited to be here and there and everywhere and wherever he is and it was cool to to hang out with him today and kind of hear him glow and when he spoke of his kids and his family and and his life that he has now and and he's a you know he he works he's a he's a regular guy uh he just had a mohawk in the 80s you know yeah. <laughs> he's just a regular guy you know uh so that's a that's that's what I like about this episode. Um, I I wanted to say you know, the, the toys kind of got out to record our first record in L.A. Everybody knows we're from Texas. Shit, maybe they don't know we're from Texas, but we we had never been anywhere, you know. So we get out there, and by that time, you know, we had we had heard feel the shake, we had heard it, it, the MTV stuff, and it was a little bit after you know, Jungle and Sweet Child of Mine and and Bathroom Wall and Sex Action by, you know, you know the P Pussycat and L.A. Guns and all that had, had already debuted. They had already gone through, you know, we're talking 87, 88, right? So by the time it's, you know, late 88 and we're out there, Jet Boy was still playing and, you know, gunning it you know pedal to the metal trying to to make noise and and uh i gotta say feel the shake would come on and i would stop and listen to that and that was the song i was like why can't they see that this is the song they just need one more of the one more of these and it could happen for them and yeah, yeah. we get to talk to mickey about reasons why it may or may not could have should have would have uh, yeah. which I think is is going to be really cool for everyone to check out. But, you know, we when we got out there, we started hearing, we heard about Rhino Bucket. We, we knew about Junkyard already because Junkyard was, we knew about Circus of Power already. And I feel like Junkyard was kind of a little bit closer to that than they were a Guns N' Roses or a Faster Pussycat. I feel like they were a little dirtier sounding, you know. Yeah, the, the the story that uh, the story of Jet Boy is is a story we've heard so many times, and anybody that pays attention to rock and roll knows how the business works. It's 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 often a case of you know the guy that signed you gets fired, and you go down the drain with him, or you know your your label's tied up in in legal a legal mess of some sort, and two years later it comes out, but the musical landscape has changed. Um, and Mickey, you know, Mickey, of course, is remembered for his mohawk. And in the late 1980s, when you're watching rock bands, this is, you know, kind of before the punks and the metalheads kind of cohabited, co-mingled, you know. They did it at the underground level, but mainstream MTV probably wasn't real sure what to do with a guy wearing spandex but has a mohawk. It's like, it's like having Janie Lane with a mohawk or something. It's just like, what do you do with this? And the well, songs maybe, were there. Maybe Janie's not a good example, but I get it. And you know I, what I'm and saying. I would, it's I would like, understand. Yeah. Well, yeah. from where from where I, you know, in the in the early '80s, you know, when uh, and he he meant, actually mentions Brian Setzer. I was going to say the Stray Cats. 
there were kids in in circles when I was, you know, 18 and 19 years old, uh, 20 years old, even that thought the stray cats were punk rock. Yeah. So yeah. for someone to see on Headbangers Ball or some kind of rock block, some guy come out with a mohawk and they're just playing heavy, dirty rock. They're in their mind they can't get past the fact that this guy's you know one of these things is not like the other yeah yeah and it's yeah. like well well that should tell you a little bit about what's going on in that that band's heads when they're up there slung down guitars low playing loud dirty rock and roll yeah so. and and i i didn't mean to suggest that you know that mickey was was anything like Janie lane i'm just saying that at mtv I, I know that. MTV at the time, you know, it, it was all about marketing. And so you could market a Mike Tramp and a David Lee Roth and uh, a Kip Winger. But what do you do with a guy like Mickey Finn, you know, because uh, on, on the other hand, he's not Anthrax or Slayer either. So what do you do with this? And then it, oddly enough, it was just a couple years later that Marilyn Manson was, you know, blowing up and and, and weird was in. <laughs> Yeah, it, exactly. It was, anything that weird seemed, was marketable all of a sudden. Anything you know? that seemed, uh, dare, dare I say, hardcore or leaning towards the the dark side, uh, that just any kind of rules on on what was going to be cool in in five minutes doesn't work when you're wearing a suit. Yeah, and and uh, but you know, the flip side of that is. As he mentions, and as as you and I know, and I think most people would would agree, the first thing you think of when you think of Jet Boy is that singer with the with the the big mohawk that was on yeah, MTV I, when I'd no like one else to, is doing I'd, it. I like to tease myself and say I don't think of that. I think of the song "Feel the Shake," and that's what yeah. I feel like people should have should have memories of is how kick-ass of a rock and roll song that was but yeah. you might be right people here want to hear with their eyes sometimes and for the most part i don't give a shit what the band looks like not entirely it's the music has to move my soul and feel yeah. the shake was one of those songs so yeah there's a mohawk but that was not my attention yeah yeah maybe for a uh, you know because the the video and the song went hand in hand in a lot of cases the, that was people's introduction well to... and at that and at that time MTV was still fairly new you know 5 years in or something and so 6 years in or whatever and you and you think like people are people are listening with their eyes yeah and that's yeah. that's just that's not how it used to be where i'm from we didn't listen with our eyes so yeah well but, you know, it, it, I called it, it, when we talked to Mickey, I called it a, a blessing and a curse. And I, I think that's kind of the, maybe the best way to sum it up. But regardless, uh, he did a lot of great things and put out some great records with Jet Boy. And he's just and, a fun, he's he just a, fun, to talk he's a to. fun guy. <laughs> and I, I, we needed to have him here today on the Talk Louder podcast. <laughs> Yep, I like it. I so like it. Mickey, you uh before we get into your musical history, I wanted to talk a little bit about the present day. You're are you in Las Vegas now? Yeah, I'm now in Las Vegas. Uh okay. it'll be two years in October, so about a year and a half. And that's after many years in Hawaii, correct? Yeah, about 15 years, but not consecutively. So I was there for about seven years. I went back to Hollywood for about seven years. That's when I got married, although I know my wife from Hawaii and she's born and raised there, but she had moved to L.A. the year after I moved there. That's when we started dating. And uh, and then we went back to Hawaii in 2014. And then we came here a year and a half ago. What was the what was the appeal to, of Las Vegas specifically? The appeal specifically is that I now have. I own a four bedroom, three bathroom, three car garage house uh, with a pool and, you know, like score, yeah, that'll do like it. a million dollar house in Hawaii. Right. That uh, was not uh, in, in the in the cards for me, but uh, we sold our little 700 square foot condo over there. And uh, we made such such a profit that we were able to come over here. My wife actually has family here. Uh, Vegas is the new LA, let's face it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yep. everyone's there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I really like it. You know, I had a pretty good, uh, I had a pretty good 
idea about Vegas kind of outside of the strip, but most people don't, right? It's like the strip, um, but you know, it's the state of Nevada, right? So we have mountains, lakes, you know, red canyons, like, you know, it's a beautiful place to live. And once you get a few miles off the strip, I'm about six, six or seven miles west of the Luxor and the Mandalay Bay, which is at the south end of the strip. And I mean, it's just like anywhere. You could could be LA, you know, I live in a nice neighborhood. Um, I live in a cul-de-sac, you know, it's chill, like um, can walk my kid to school, you know, like if I go look out my bedroom window, I can see the stratosphere and I can see the lights from the strip, you know, but it's far enough back that once you get away from it, it's just like suburbia anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. But, but you have that convenience of always stuff going on, clubs, shows, events, amazing restaurants everywhere. So it's a very convenient place to live. Yeah. And, well, hold on. Hold on. Give me one second. Oh, you're yeah. good. Is it convenient? He's over at. I'm doing the. I'm live on the air right now. Oh. You want to come say hi? Yeah. Come here. Come say hi. Well. This this is my baby girl. <gasps> hi. Hey. Hi. Hi. How are, How are you? you? That's Jason. Say hi, Jason. Hi. And that's David. Hi. How are you? What's your name? <laughs> She's singing a song. <laughs> okay. so her name is Evangeline Barbara Kamalani Demeter, but ah. we call her Evie. So when you ask her her name, she says Evie Evangeline Barbara Kamalani Demeter. She <laughs> wants you to You're know. Right. It, it does she sound gives, like a song. She gives you all the syllables. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's that's great. Yeah, that that's might be the youngest. Hawaii gift. Are. Everybody has long names and seven names and stuff, you know. Well, that might be <laughs> the most adorable moment we've ever had on the Talk Louder. Yeah, podcast. and and probably yeah. the youngest guest ever too. So. Yeah, yeah she, yeah, she just turned four. Wow. Um. Yeah, I had my mom and dad out here, and I had my my aunt from New Jersey that I haven't seen for twenty years. My dad's sister, he hasn't seen her for ten years. We brought her out, uh, so it was a little kind of mini family reunion. Great. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what's going on in your world besides obviously raising a family and, and that sort of thing. I know uh, you're, you're in the, the, forgive my ignorance, is it the hair product business? Yep. And we call it men's grooming because it's men's gr- hair, you go. Hair, shave products. And the industry that really revolves around specifically barbershops and salons. So the brands that I've represented um, you know, you generally don't find in Walmart or, or, uh, you know, just anywhere, but specifically in the barber shop is kind of our, our culture and our industry. And, and that whole thing has become such a lifestyle industry over the last 10 years. I've watched it grow. Um, I used to work for a brand out of Orange County, uh, called Laywright. And they are one of the biggest, so it's, it's water-based pomades, um, you know, hair clay, hair paste, all of that whole genre, texture powders, sea salt spray, you know, shampoo, um, but but specifically kind of niche stuff that you find in uh, in barbershops, cool barbershops and stuff like that. So right on. Th- th- this should probably come as no surprise to a guy that used to sport a mohawk. So. Of course. Yep. Yep. And, and didn't you also work for lip service way back in another yep. lifetime? Yeah. So when I first moved back to Hollywood from Hawaii, uh, which was 2006, and uh, I was good friends with the owner, Drew Bernstein, uh, rest in peace, my friend, um, for 25 years, you know, we were friends since the early Jet Boy days. And, um, yeah, he gave me a job and I stayed with him for about a year at his house, like in the Hollywood Hills. And it was, um, a good kind of introduction back to, because prior to that, I had gone off on like a 10 year tangent of like DJ electronic music stuff. And so 2006 was really the time when Billy from Jet Boy started contacting me again. And he started working with Brian Pereira from Cleopatra and, you know, like that, first kind of revival started happening and um i hadn't thought about 
being in Jet Boy again up to that point ever. You know, like I was DJ Milo was a whole new thing. I never even talked about my years as a musician with Jet Boy during that time. Uh, you know, I was just like DJing raves and like underground full moon parties and stuff like that. And it was just like, it wasn't like a cool thing to be like, Hey, by the way, I used to be this like glam rocker. guy. <laughs> like, yeah. It's kind of, <laughs> that's like the late, late, late night conversation with the go, what's your yeah. background, dude. Hey, yeah. cheers. All right. Yeah. You know, it's like end of the day kind of yeah. campfire. Like only talk. people who I, you know, got really close with. Sure. And then at some point I would pull it out or they would find out and be right. like, dude, right. you know? yeah. but, but look, Ar you know, when it, when it, when the call came back, right. Um, I didn't have any trouble jumping back into that world. You know, like I moved to LA, I um, got a job at lip service and like, boom, it started happening. Jet Boy started doing shows again. We had our, our first uh, reunion revival where we put out uh, an EP off your rocker came out of that era. Yeah. Um, we did a lot of shows, a lot of festivals and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, since then I've kind of learned to be the, you know, embrace it all. Right. You know, so we, we all have this crazy roadmap path where we've been in life and you don't need to, every time you kind of reinvent yourself or go through a change, um, you know, just not be proud of the other stuff you did as well, or keep that as part of you. Well, what you got there? You, you need to get some birds, man. This, this is my jam right here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we've never had that on the, on the talk louder podcast. Either. We've got, we've got, <laughs> I live in Vegas now. This got is our lip balm. It's like dry lips, <laughs> dry hands, knuckles, elbows. Oh my yeah. God. My that's wife a, and I were like, that's I'm a coming from Hawaii. Kind of it's a different kind of heat than Texas. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Close. Yeah. Close. It's, it's humid here though. Yeah. You know, what's weird about here is the hottest part of the year through the peak of summer is actually our monsoon season. So even though we hardly ever see rain, the humidity level goes up. Right. So you would think that during the hottest part of the summer, it would be the driest in Vegas, but, humidity levels uh, you can tell i'm a guy who watches the news every day right like yeah <laughs> i'm a regular grown-up now i watch the news every day the weather report you know uh guilty i do the same yep. sure yep. So yep. you you were talking just a minute ago uh i was going to get to it but let's let's talk about it now since we're sort of on the subject you were talking about sort of this revival of jet boy you were doing some of the festival dates i i actually saw you at the south texas rock festival mm -hmm. and um I've been friends with Billy for a number of years. And then you guys put out a great album called Born to Fly. Yeah. And that yeah. came out in like, God. I want to say 2018 or something. Yeah, that, that was really at a point. I mean, I had been living in Hawaii, but we had still been doing, you know, in an, you know, weekend warrior stuff, you know, a festival here, a show there. And we would usually try to tack on one or two shows to help cover the costs, you know. Right. Um, by the time you pay for flights, because remember, it was like, oh, this guy's flying from Hawaii. He's flying from San Francisco. He's flying from L.A. You know, it's like all of a sudden you got like the cost of just getting there eats up whatever you're getting paid for the show. So we would try to tack on, you know, a, a Friday and a Sunday or whatever and, and do a three show thing. But we had been doing that for a while and kind of just settling in. Maybe at that point, we were, there was even a lull for a while. Um, and then we got, uh, the, the call through, I believe Chuck at artists worldwide, our, our agent, and he had gotten contacted by frontiers records. Um, and, and that was it. It was like, Hey, there's this label. They're like from Italy, but they're doing the new LA gun stuff. And they do a ton of, you know, rock and metal stuff. And they made us an offer to do a record. And, um, you know, I think at that point it had been since uh, 2008 that we had written any new music or may maybe even not. I almost even feel like the, the, the new songs that were on Off Your Rocker, um, we wrote uh, when I was in L.A. still before I went back to Hawaii. So, yeah, it had been a long time since me and Billy and Fern, like the songwriting 
you know, uh, magic of, yeah. of the group, because I really do believe we have magic together when the three of us get together. So it'd been a long time since we tried to do anything. And, um, you know, God bless Billy. He's always been the, really the heart and soul of this band, the most passionate one. And he became proficient in logic. And um, so he was able to start recording you know, basic ideas and sending them to me, but they were like good quality. Like they had drum, you know, program drum beats mm -hmm. and, and parts and stuff. So um, it was easy for me to, you know, uh, I love writing that way. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I'll come up with a melody or, or a, a lick, you know, and be like, Hey, go dad, da, 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 you know, but I love when, when, you know, when my guys like, play me stuff and it's like oh yeah yeah and i boom and just start writing right yep. yeah um so you know that's what we did you know billy just started sending me files and he would get together with fern randomly and um you know uh did you guys feel like you got to promote it properly because i thought it was a really good album and but i didn't hear a lot of buzz about you touring no look th that's the thing right um the label gave us x amount of dollars to to cover everything the recording um whatever budget we needed to you know trips to la we did record that um you know at a studio and, and just to cover all the costs and then there was like a small budget for like a video or two that that we got from them yeah saw the video but 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 kind of like that's it right that's that's how a lot of these small labels are they don't have tons of money to put behind promotion campaigns and whatnot and, you know, remember, the, the, we're, we're guys who don't make a living off the band, right? So everybody's got jobs and lives, and um, it's not like we have a ton of time to promote. What we did on our end, obviously the fun stuff, the creative stuff, is we kept making videos. So I think we did five, um, maybe six, five or six videos um, that, that we just did with friends on like the shoestring budget or no budget, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But they came out cool. I think all the videos we did for the record are like cool and they're in cool places and we worked with really rad people and whatnot. But, um, isn't your dad in one of the videos? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, old dog, new tricks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. That was cool. my concept idea on that. And, uh, my parents live in like a, retirement community area in Northern California with golf courses and stuff, you know, and yeah, it was, well, I thought it was a great record. Anybody that was a jet boy fan back in the day that hasn't heard it or somehow it, it snuck out under the radar and you missed it, go check it out. It's called born to fly. If you like the, uh, the other, the older jet boy stuff, you'll love, you'll love born yeah. to fly. I mean, that was the intention too, right. Was to, um, please the old school jet boy fans. Uh, but also kind of take it to what would have been, I think, the next step after Damnation. Yeah. Right. I mean, feel the shake and then Damnation. There was a progression. And I feel like Born to Fly, just as if we didn't, if there was no time in between, Born to Fly was the next progression. I feel like yeah. um, it would have come out right after Damnation. So. Let's go back to Feel the Shake and Damnation. So you guys, I, I'm, I'm not sure a lot of people know, but. There was a time in the late 80s when the big the big bands, the big three bands in California was Poison, Guns N' Roses and Jet Boy. Yeah. And you were, you know, you were one of the big dogs in the yeah. in the California scene out there. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, I think Jet Boy has got to be the classic example of bad luck, bad timing, misfortune, uh, the label mismanaging your record and, and all this sort of thing. Um, how do you look back on that time? Uh, and tell me a little bit about it. Cause you guys were, were peers of these bands that, that, you know, went on to huge success and whatnot, uh, yeah, but you yeah. were right there with them neck and neck. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't use the term peers because, you know, we were, you know, we just came up at the same time. We were bros, we were buddies, we were, you know, just, just doing the same thing and helping each other. We, we, we played shows in San Francisco when we had built up to the biggest headlining status in San Francisco, we brought guns and roses up and people were just starting to hear about them and they opened for us and we headlined and 
they were huge shows. This, we did the same thing with Poison, and both bands did the same thing with us. They brought us down to L.A. We opened for them. We opened for Poison. Um, so it was, yeah, I mean, and I feel like, um, you know, in, in any era like this, right, like our, our era, uh, short-lived as it, as it was, I, I know there's way more stories like ours than the success stories. Oh yeah. But it's just weird to be, to be one of them, you know what I mean? And, and I've, you know, run the gamut of all emotions regarding it, but ultimately you have to be at peace with it and say, this is just how it, it was. And it didn't work out for us in, in the big picture, but um, just still proud of the whole journey and everything we did. And sure. Um, you know, it was kind of a tumultuous time in the music industry, right? Um, because, you know, for us, like, we got signed to Elektra, and then Elektra was an East Coast label, but they had West Coast offices. You know, like, right before our release date, they fired everybody in the West Coast offices from the president, Peter Philman, on down. Wow. You know, our a &R guy, like, it was just clean house, and, you know, well, I don't care what they were working on, shelve it, you know, we're going to regroup this or whatever. Like, that's something you don't, you're not prepared for is the big company moves that these huge corporations, the companies make. And then, you know, um, you know, that, like I said, that short lived maybe four year period. So you lose a year there between going from Electra to MCA there was literally almost a year of negotiations, just contracts back and forth where you're just going as a musician, like, fuck, come on, man, we want to get on the road. Like all these other bands are touring and they're, you know, opening for Aerosmith and all this shit's going on. Like, you know, <laughs> um, but you know, like, let's face it, the, the industry back then were guys in suits and ties and, you know, they don't know what the fuck they're doing, man. They're like, you know, so, uh, yeah, then and we got feel the shake out, but but ultimately they didn't want to put feel the shake out, right? They they wanted us to start fresh and do a new record, and we're like, dude, like you know, it, I mean, it took two years to get signed, a year to sign a contract. We made an amazing album with Tom Allen, an amazing producer. Like it's done. This is the moment it's happening right now. Like, why would you not want to just put it out? Right. And, and they said, okay, fine, we'll put it out. But that was kind of it, right? They put it out. We toured for three months and they were like, all right, the labels pull in your tour support. They want you to come back and start working on your next record. So, all right, we got a little taste of it. You know, we toured with kicks. We toured with striper. I think we toured with cheap trick. Um, and, um, you know, we started working on the next record, which, um, God, man, again, they, they just gruel you. Right. You know, like they want you to write 50 songs, you know, it's like, what, why do we need 50 songs? Well, they're going to nitpick every detail of every little song. And then they're going to, in their mind, come up with the best ones. You know, um, they kind of force us to work with a couple co-writers that we weren't into or whatever, but super proud of damnation love that record i love it more than feel the shake um yeah, it yeah. was the progression of where we went um and uh and and then once again right like the record came out and then you know sony music came in and bought mca like mm. like like a huge like, like like a company bought mca universal you know like wow. yeah and and that was a that was a big and bustling record label office. And I remember coming back off the tour. We were supposed to go on tour with Extreme. I think we we did our first run, and then we had like two more tours lined up. Um, and they were like, "Oh, you know, record company pulled your support. You guys got to come back." And they were like, they didn't want to say anything. And we're just like, "Yep, yeah, just just you guys got to come back." You know, we're like, "Well, what the fuck?" And then we come back, and they're like, you know you guys have been dropped and like, wow, you know, like we went to the record label, like to sign some papers or some shit. And it was literally like empty cubicles and desks, like the whole bustling office of like a hundred, you know, desks and people on phones and shit going on just empty. Wow. 
Yeah. And did, didn't you, uh, Paul Stanley came into your rehearsal space one yeah, time. Wasn't that, he that interested? That was a cool one. Yeah. yeah uh, he, tell, tell us about that. He was interested in producing you or something. Yeah. Yeah. He was. Yeah. I mean, talk about, talk about nervous, right? Like we're at SIR studios, you know, like in a little room and Paul Stanley comes in and sits on the couch and like, you know, all right, guys, play a song, you know, <laughs> like, but uh, yeah, yeah stop, cool. stop staring at me. Stop, yeah. Start playing music. <laughs> yeah, we I, also can't even, I can't even imagine with fucking Brian Setzer. <clears throat> oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Brian Setzer. When we were, when we were rehearsing weekly at SIR, we had our gear. Or this was back in the days. If you remember when, they would, you would store your gear in a locker at the place. So like, I don't know why they never thought of like nowadays, most rehearsal studios, the gears there and you just show up with your guitar. But back then all the bands had their gear like stored in lockers and each night you got there and you broke it all out and set it up and got the PA going. But uh, during that time, I remember we pulled into the parking lot and we saw this fucking hot rod. We're like, Oh damn, man. And, we, we find out Brian Setzer was in there rehearsing. So I think Billy was the one that went up to him and was just like, oh, man, we're, we're huge fans. You know, our fans, Jet Boy, like, you know, oh, man, love to. I don't even know how it came about. Like, if he was just like, oh, come on in and jam a song with us. But before you know it, Billy's walking in the door. He's like, yeah, Brian Setzer is going to come in. He's going to jam a song with us, you know. And he did. He just wow. came in and met us all and was like, right on, guys. And he plugged in and we played like. I think we played Folsom Prison and Great Balls of Fire or something, which were uh, regulars in our set as encores. Right. And like, th those are the moments, right? You know, I, I think I sent you guys a picture of us with Bo Diddley. Yeah. Like we, I don't even know. Like, that was the cool thing about that time, 80s, 90s, late 80s, early 90s, where there was such a mishmash of everything. Somehow we got the offer to open for Bo Diddley. Like, what the fuck Jeff Boy had to do with Bo Diddley? But it was fucking amazing. And we hung out with him backstage and like, you know, broke out his guitar, Lucille, square guitar and all that shit. Just like, holy shit. You know? Wow. Cool. That's cool crazy, stuff. man. Well, yeah. So, you know, you guys maybe you know maybe maybe all the pieces of the puzzle didn't fit at the right time but you definitely left behind a body of work you can be proud of like you said yeah and uh, and you've got these amazing stories like the the yep. few you've just shared with us yep. um I, I gotta know who or what inspired the mohawk because that was a hard sell in 1988 yeah, 89 so, so look the, the answer to that is that i was a punk rocker right before i got into glam rock right like i went from you know, like, like a stoner kid listening to Zeppelin. And, and I mean, I listened to all that, like Jethro Tull and yes, and rush and you know what I mean? Long hair, like in, in high school. And then, um, I kind of got into for a little bit, um, you know, started getting into more metal, you know, Iron Maiden and stuff like that. And then I got into punk rock, man. And it was like for, for two solid years, I was like, fully in it man like i had a great punk rock crew from san jose california a lot of guys like lars from rancid yeah. like he remembers me from back then because he was like i don't know five years younger than me or whatever so he was like a little kid when i was kind of like hanging with all the big cool punk rockers and stuff you know but there was a lot of cool people from that scene and and i was super into it and i had a mohawk in fact that's where the name finn came from because I had a mohawk that was was just a fin, right? It yeah. wasn't all the way back. It was just a straight shark fin, right? And um, people started calling me Finhead Mike, you know. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, the, and then and then you know, getting into the glam scene and just kind of like you know, had the long hair and teased up, and I was all New York Dolls and High Rocks and all that cool shit. Um, and then my girlfriend at the time was like a death rock chick yeah but but she's the one that introduced me to todd because she was friends with his girlfriend at the time and she kind of kind of brought me into that uh because a lot of those goth kids were into like johnny thunders and like you know uh the you know the, the glam stuff right i mean i mean the lords of the new church came out at that time yeah yeah Invader, that's a bit, you know? bit of a crossover yeah exactly exactly yeah. So she was, I think she was actually for like a couple months going to, uh, 
to uh, beauty school, you know, it, we, it was a fucked up time. We were like doing hard drugs and like just partying and, you know, but, but she was like, oh yeah, you should shave the sides of your head. And she did, she shaved my head. If you look at all of those early pictures with the orange hair and blue hair and whatever, she was the one like dyeing my hair and all that stuff, you know? Um, but, but it was kind of, I don't know, like as much as you can look at it as like, it was a hard sell, but like at the time it didn't seem that way. At the time, it seemed to instantly be recognized as, ah, oh, that's fucking rad. And then people would be like, oh, Jet Boy, the, ba- the guy with the mohawk, you know, like that yeah. started happening right away. Yeah. So man, I just, we were just, you know, for the music industry at that time, I remember when, uh, when our second video from, uh, well, our first video from Damnation was the song Evil. Yeah. And I remember when, when we, Sent it to MTV and they played it on Headbangers Ball and it seemed to be a big hit and, and they wouldn't play it at, uh, in daytime rotation. And we were like, like, what's the problem? And, and then there, you know, like management, like, you know, your manager's like, all like, well, you know, I didn't want to say this, but they specifically said that they didn't like mixed Mohawk. And it was too scary. It was too dark and stare, scary for daytime rotation. And I'm like, and and I think it was like the next year, there's like Marilyn Manson going, sweet, sweet, all bad, all bad. And I'm just like, wow, that changed quick. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, it it definitely is is a thing, right? Who knows? You know, was that the thing that we couldn't get categorized? It was definitely talked about that we didn't fit into that poison mold. There were things that my management told me that strongly suggested that I do something different. Yep. I won't say what it is because it's, I didn't, obviously I didn't have a mohawk, mm-hmm. but it was so, my, it was, it was minutia they were worried about. Right. Like really, really your mohawk is going to keep our video from being played. Yeah. That is. Yep. Yep it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And the irony of it is that at that time, like during our peak for those between feel the shake and damnation touring and peak years, my mom could go to the grocery store every week and go to the magazine rack. And she would just flip through all the rock magazines and she would just come home with stacks. We were highly visual in the world of music. Sure. We were always, almost completely, always reviewed positively, right? And so then you got these record company people and whatever people at MTV and people at radio, and you're like, what's really going on here? Like, you know what I mean? Like everyone, all the critics, and you know, like that, that hardly happens, you know what I mean? But for whatever it was, of course, there's the there's the stuff we couldn't control, which right. Electra firing their offices and just maybe they just missed it. Maybe they just didn't take the time to look at what we had going on at that time. Yeah. And MCA, you know, they just were just we're just cleaning house, you know, oh, how and, times have changed. I mean, I remember at that time, uh, Hanson, remember the group Hanson? Of course. Yeah. They were on MCA. And I remember finding out that they kept Hanson. And they dropped Jet Boy. And I was like, mother, I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. And I'm not hating on them at all, but it's it's clear to see where, you know what I mean? Yeah, we were on the other side of the tracks. It's like, yeah. I don't know, let's go with all the safe stuff here or whatever. Right. And, and and we weren't even fucking crazy, right? Like Guns N' Roses were the craziest motherfuckers in the industry just belligerently fucking doing and saying what they fucking wanted and always fucking, you know, making messes to be cleaned up. And that's even more proof that your Mohawk didn't, it, right. it yeah, doesn't right. sound like it, it doesn't hold water to me. The yeah. stories do not hold water yeah. from, yeah, yeah, from yeah. upper management and people at MTV and yeah. uh, they're, maybe they're afraid of getting fired. You know, you come and it's your labels, a ghost town. You come yeah. it's like a hundred desks that are yeah. with no people at sitting yeah. at them. You know, they should have realized how good they had it 
Yeah. Because it's like, we fucking spent $50,000 on this video for you motherfuckers. And now you're not going to play it. Like it's everything you, it, it was that, that evil video encompasses everything that was going on in rock and metal videos at that time. There was yeah. no, it's like, what do you mean? This is perfect. It fits right in with all this other shit. Okay. Yeah. The guy's got a little hook, whatever, but it's still, you could play Cinderella and fucking Guns N' Roses and Jet Boy. And we you know what I mean. It wouldn't be like, you know, what the fuck is ass, you know, like. Right. Uh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been so left field. I mean, know? was it, it doesn't, <laughs> it sounds like it was, uh, made for made to order like it was there was there was a naked chick at the end i mean you couldn't see anything but but she was naked with snakes crawling on her and a spider crawls across her face i mean come on alice cooper still got a huge fucking career he's the spider king you know yeah in 89 my video had snakes and rats and spiders in it too yeah Yeah. i have snakes in my room right now by the way perfect I have an albino uh, sun glow boa. Wow. And you I've told us. Geckos you... I breed. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a critter guy, man. I've always well, had lizards and snakes. And when I moved to Hawaii, I couldn't have any of that. Oh. So you're making uh, up for it now. It's all illegal, right, over there. So now that I'm back here, yeah, I've got I've got a nice tegu lizard I'm growing up. They get about 15 pounds. I've got uh, a pair 15 of 15 pounds? Over. Yeah. Wow. Tegus. Look them up from Argentina. Wow, man. That's like a dog. I've kept them before, too. <laughs> hey, awesome. so you, you mentioned Todd Crew, and um, I want to talk about Todd uh, for for a little bit. Uh, he was the bass player in your band before you got signed, uh, was 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 let go from the band, um, and was replaced by Sammy Yaffa from right. Hanoi Rocks, one of your heroes. And then uh, Todd unfortunately passed away at a very young age, like 21 or something when he was out working, he was on the road with guns and roses working as a tech or a roadie or something like that. And you've said in the past that Todd, and you said it earlier that Todd kind of brought you into the jet boy fold. Absolutely. Yep. He, he he had just started jamming with Billy and Fern and Ron, our drummer. And I actually, when I met Todd through our girlfriends that were friends, I thought, because I had a band at the time in San Jose called Sweet Evil. And um, here, wait, hold on. I have a picture. There's, you won't find this anyway, but anywhere, but let's see. Can you see it? It's got a bit of a glare. A glary. On. Oh, there you now, go. If you hold yeah, that, that's better. There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah, hold it like that. Yeah, yeah, you, so look you like can see our... we're standing on top of a mausoleum in a cemetery. We were like, Love it. we were uh, Black Sabbath meets Motley Crue. Yeah, it looks like an yeah. early, and early So I, I met Todd and I was like, you know, I, th- I think it was like, he was like, oh, you got to come, come try out for Jet Boy, you know? And I was like, no, you got to come try out for my band, Sweet Evil, because our bass player was just leaving. And he, and he did. I remember he came and tried out for us. And I think that was enough for him to, to hear me sing. And then he was just like, no, dude, dude, like, fuck these San Jose stoner guys. Like, you need to get in this band. We're like, you know, glam rock and all. And uh, and, and with that that talk, that talk went back and forth for a while, right? You know, yeah. I don't know, you know, a month or whatever. And it was talked about and talked about. And then I started meeting Bill and Fern out on on the broadway uh strip that was like san francisco's version of sunset was broadway and north beach were the stone and the on broadway and mabuhe and you know that was always like punk rock and metal i call and that holy ground yeah totally yep and uh so i started meeting billy and fern and they were always like yeah man we hear you're a great singer you know you need to come come check us out try out for a band whatever and i was like yeah yeah you know just kind of in transition. And then I think one night on a, on a drunken drug induced binge. Um, Cause Fern loves to tell this story, how I was like, like laying down in piss alley was what we called it. The alley uh, behind the Mabuhe and, and the on Broadway, there was like an alley there and we called it piss alley. And he's like, you know, I picked him up and was like, you know, dude, you need to come try out for us tomorrow. You know, Todd said, you're going to come try out for us tomorrow. And 
probably wasted and said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to come. I'm going to come tomorrow. And then, of course, I didn't. And they showed up at my girlfriend's house, like literally showed up. And she was like, come on, get up, go try out for their band. You know, I was like, no, no. Fucking... <laughs> And they just literally like picked me up and carried me in my fucking socks and threw me in the car. And, uh, and, and that was it. Right. Like I went, they started playing songs and that like how my brain works. I immediately started coming up with melodies and, and lyric ideas. And I grabbed a pen and paper and I started jotting shit down right then. And I think probably like uh, car sex and maybe little teaser and a few of our early songs came out of that moment you know like i wow. wrote it real quick and then jumped on and started singing and then it was like all right you know i, so I can't remember if i was even todd, still as todd well. was right yeah todd was right yeah, yeah. He was right and from that moment like me and todd were fucking the best of friends wow right uh I, I mean in the long spectrum of things i would say me and billy are like brothers you know like as cl closer than brothers as close as you can be eventually that would evolve but during those years with todd we were we were the best of buds and um unfortunately that also included um you know doing a lot of drugs together using needles you know what i mean um uh, bad drugs and and uh um, good times but uh you know i i think you learn as you get older that everybody has different tolerance levels and addiction levels you know, and uh, when you're 21, it's hard to identify someone who you, sh you know, like I can look back at it now and go like, God, we should have done more. We should have gotten more help. But, you know, at that time, you're just too young and green and thinking like, come on, dude, get your shit together. You know, ah, we all fucking party. But, you know, like if I may, I usually, you know, when there's a story like this, I usually try to get a couple of words in and say this, thank you for sharing this. Cause it's sometimes not easier for everyone to talk about. Yeah. When you're talking about losing your bro. Yeah. But for the most part, when I, when I, where I'm really taking this is because you're 21 years old, you're a fucking child. Yeah. You guys don't know how to treat each other. You yeah. don't know how to hold each other up. Yeah. You, you just ah leave him in piss alley. He'll be fine. They didn't do that. They picked you up and took you out of there. According to Fern. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that part of the story was awesome. Yeah. But but the other part where you just don't know how to handle someone who's going deeper, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, it's and, just, and, and, it's just and I sad. think you know, it's like the, the, the sign, the warning signs were all there. But sure. you got to remember, too, then you do have older people, record label people, management people, and all of those people are getting in your ear going, you need to fucking lose this guy. Cause he's going to fuck everything up for you. You guys need to be solid. You can't be fucking shit up. You can't be making excuses why he missed the most important meeting of your career at the record label. And, you know, I mean, it, it was, uh, so, so, so you get that going too. I mean, in retrospect, this is what we did. We, we, we obviously tried to talk to him as our brother and we went as far as involving his parents and getting an intervention and getting him into rehab. Um, but he left, he, he like went AWOL from rehab, like in the first couple of days or whatever. And it was Northern California. Like he jumped on a bus or whatever and came straight back to LA and, and he went to the Guns N' Roses house, you know, like not trying to put anything on them whatsoever. But there started this kind of divide where, I mean, me and Todd were the only ones in Jet Boy that had done intravenous drugs and kind of went further. Billy and Fern and Ron never did. It was just drinking and smoking weed or whatever. Um, but I think with those guys and, you know, let's face it, they're, you know, there's, like I said, there's different tolerance levels and addiction levels in people. They're, those guys were handling their shit and they yeah. fucking handled it. They made great records and they had a great career and, you know, delivering the goods, you know, but uh, for, for Todd to, to kind of make that jump, it was definitely like, you know, 
fuck you guys. I'm going to go hang out with my real bros. You know what I mean? Because we had apartments. Like, he had a place to, to live, you know, with us. But yeah. it started being like he would spend the night out there, you know, because they had a big party house in Hollywood Hills and spending more time there. And then after that, um, when he bailed rehab, it was kind of like, you know, I mean, we threw in the towel, you know, like, I wish we didn't, man. I, I wish... You know, we, we would have done more and we would have um, stood by him and just try to give him the strength to get through it, you know. Yeah. But Well, you're, you're young and you're, there's a lot of pressure. You got a label that wants an yeah. album out of you exactly. and, and exactly. pointing it. To uh, I, I'm not trying to compare myself, but I did hear Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols in an interview say the same thing about Sid Vicious about mm -hmm. how years later he came to terms with like, fuck man, I turned my back on my friend. Like I fucking didn't, wasn't there for him and I didn't help him as much as I could. And I'll, I live with that, that, you know, I should have done more, you know? And, and so you, you have that, you have that feeling, you know, Todd still visits, visits me in my dreams. And so what I call it, so does Drew from lip service, you know, the, the, there's a few people in your life that you get so close to that they still kind of randomly appear in dreams. And, and Todd's one of those people, you know? Yeah. Um, well, let's hope that it's, you know, the good stuff. It's memories of good things. Yeah, it yeah, is. For sure. That's good. It, that's for good. sure. Tell us, let's jump ahead to Cold Blue Rebels. Tell us a little bit yeah. about that band. When yeah. was that band around? What was that? What was the vibe, the sound? The, obviously, you had a very distinct look. Um, yeah. Yep. Oh, tell Man, us. Some, of, some, of, some of my best and favorite work in the music world as well. So I had moved uh, back to L.A. in 2006, got together with my girlfriend in 2007. There was some tumultuous stuff with Jet Boy for a period. And um, I reconnected with my old friend Danny Dangerous from the Zeros, not Purple Haired Zeros. And um, I found out that he was kind of into like rockabilly and psychabilly stuff, which I was as well. I love psychabilly. If you're not familiar, it's basically punk rock mixed with rockabilly. Yeah. Upright bass. Um, and it's just it's a huge nationwide genre. It's, it's really big in Europe. I don't and, know if you uh, consider them rockabilly, but Reverend Horton Heat. Yeah, Re Reverend Orton Heath, yeah. most people will say is psychobilly, you know? Yeah. Um, they, and, have and, that, they have that little bit of crossover going. For sure, for sure. Um, and and we were like, there's a certain uh, style within psychobilly that is all horror stuff, you know? So we dress like zombies. All of our songs are about like graveyards and monsters and murder and, you know, um all the fun stuff yeah all, all the fun stuff super it. creative right like like it's it was very artistic and creative with with everything we did from our stage show and all the artwork and logos and merch you, right we did were you have big... elvira in one of your videos <laughs> no <laughs> my that would have worked that would have worked if you look at our the our first video which is the song cold blue and beautiful uh, stars my wife and her hearse that she used to drive around la awesome um, but yeah, it was an awesome band. So we, we put it together with, it wound up being, uh, spaz drastic on drums, who was in the glamor punks mm -hmm. and then, uh, Joe normal, who was the guitar player in the zeros. And we all really just embraced the genre, you know, like spaz had played in, in some, uh, rockabilly bands where he was doing like the stand up, like slim Jim from the stray cats. Yeah. And Joe is just a phenomenal guitar player and m musician. Like I, that guy could, you know, put a little work into it and literally play any style of guitar. So he really embraced the, um, you know, all the hollow body twangy fender amps. And, um, you know, he was every bit of Brian Setzer at the same time as Johnny Thunders and, you know, playing uh you know punk rock style guitar as well um the shows were super theatrical we had zombie go go dancers coffins on stage um and and we just kind of blew up yeah like it it I, I think we started that band we wrote six songs and we played a show and from that moment on we just got non-stop offers 
Yeah. And we just started fucking gigging, I think, for like a year. We just played every weekend. We played constantly all up and down California, uh, trips to Arizona. And it, it literally got to a point where, I mean, it was like we learned a couple covers, but it was like we had six songs, you know? And we, we, we would play shows and be done. And they'd be like, another. they're like, come on, they want you guys back out. And we're like, we don't fucking know anything else. You know, like, what are we supposed to whip out? So like, you know, we just didn't have time to rehearse anything extra. It was just shows, 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 shows. We didn't even rehearse. We just played shows. And then we, we said, all right, this is, this is happening. We took some time off. We started turning down offers. We wrote another six songs and then we put out our first uh, record. It's a full length record. Uh, recording is quality is not my favorite. The recording was great. We did it at uh, third street recording uh, in Santa Monica. Uh, kind of a cool, small, but really cool. Everybody's fucking recorded there. Lemmy from Motorhead. Like it's really rad place. Um, and we did the whole record in one night like like one take songs you know what i mean um it, it sounds amazing it's super rad uh we didn't really have it mastered properly which is why i think it doesn't hold up to our second uh ep where the production sounds much better but uh yeah so so we did that and then we just started touring we went on tour with a lot of bands we supported fucking a ton of bands which worked to our favor because we got to just go out there and build a following based on like we did. God, I think we did three tours with Wednesday 13. You know who he is from the murder dolls. And, yeah. Right. So we did like, I think like we, the first tour we opened and it was like three bands on tour. And then the second band we we're, or, or four bands on tour. And then the second tour it, we were in the second slot. And then the third tour we were in the support slot or whatever, you know, um, and we, you know, the, the crowds were really hot topic, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like they, they were just goth kids, no, every, punk everybody kids, knows, punk every, kids, right? Yeah. I mean, I remember playing shows and kids would come up to us and, and they didn't have never seen an upright bass. And they were like, wow. you know, what the fuck is that thing? It's like a giant fucking violin or something, you know? Yeah. That's um, funny. so it was cool to, to get that response. We also played a lot of all ages shows which is great if you have a big merch program like we did. We had a traveling fucking store. So we had like eight t-shirt designs, jackets, hoodies, patches, buttons, keychains. We even had Cold Blue Rebel condoms. Like it was just like a fucking barrage of stuff. And, and kids just came up like, I think we would do those tours. We did tours where uh, we made like 300 bucks a night but we would do like 800 or a thousand bucks in merch. Mm -hmm. And it was like, fuck yeah, man, we're killing it. You know, yeah. meanwhile, Wednesday 13 is over there with like a little booth with like two t-shirts and he started going like, fuck man, you know, <laughs> it's like after the first or second tour, he got with our bass player and he was like, yeah, man, I want you to help me like develop my merch program, you know, because we had all these contacts. We have uh, a friend in Bakersfield. Shout out to Mark from the Mentors. Um, and he's a tattoo artist and uh, he has a silk screening, little silk screening shop. So he would let us come up and we would like bust out the shirts ourselves. You know, we would go down to Santee Alley in downtown L.A. and buy like the bags of like slightly irregular shirts and shit. <laughs> Yeah. make shit up but but it worked man you know it's tough nowadays to be a club a club level touring band is almost impossible you know yeah. because yeah. you know people don't want to pay 50 bucks you know to go to a 300 seat club but then as the promoter you're like you know i mean what what can you offer about three grand you know what i mean yeah. um and then as a band when you consider all the expenses most bands don't own their vehicle so you rent a van a trailer gas food for five guys hotels you know what i mean it's like yeah uh, it's it's a grind and, and so ultimately that's that's kind of what we did we we came we fucking killed it we blew it up and then we got to a point where we were like fuck this you know what i mean like it's it gets hard you can't you know, I can't I can't go out and do a six weeks tour and come back and pay all my bills. Right. You know what I mean? It's like my you know, my wife at the time, we didn't have kids yet, but we were working. You know, you got your yeah. rent and all your bills and my wife's waiting tables or whatever. And 
say, I'm going to take off for six weeks, you know, fuck, you come home, you got all kinds of bills and shit. And, um, and, uh, I miss it. You know, I was hoping to maybe rekindle it when I came back here, but, uh, Joe, the guitar player has got other stuff going on with his music career. And, um, I don't know. It, it could still happen. You never know. Spaz is ready to go. Danny's ready to go. If we can get Joe on board, um, it may happen. But I might just start a new band here in Vegas, too, because I'm kind of getting sick of doing the whole long distance, the yeah. long distance love affair thing. You know, like there's a, there's a lot of folks there you could probably reach out to who would do it. Yeah, in a yeah, second with you, sure. man. Yeah, for sure. I just have to get to a point where I have time because yeah. with a six year old and a four year old and. Like my wife's off to work right now. I got the two kids. As soon as I hang up with you guys, yeah. be like, I'm hungry. You yeah. <laughs> so, and then you know, I have a house, right? I got to clean my pool and take care yep. of the house. I got yep. a full-time yep. job. I work from home. I'm blessed to have that, you know, Yeah. yeah. but, um, you know, well, tell, tell us real quick. Uh, uh, I was going to ask you one more question and then we'll let you go. Cause I know you've got your hands full, but I wanted to know, we like to ask our guests uh, on the show. What was, what was the one thing that got you hooked on rock and roll? What's the, the childhood memory, the first album, the first concert, the oh, first TV. Yeah, appearance? Yeah, yeah. I remember because, um, God, you gotta be really old to remember this, but there was a thing that came out when I was probably, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years old or something like that. It was called the Taken Tape. And it was a little trendy cassette recorder. And they came in like red, blue, yellow, or green or whatever. And it was like, had a little handle. And it was like a tape recorder, right? So you could play cassettes on it and you can put a blank cassette and like record or whatever. And I was so happy to get it. Like I got it for my birthday. I was like, yeah, you know? But, you know, I didn't know what to put on it or whatever. And I think one of the first cassette tapes, well, definitely was Elton John, right? Like uh, El Elton John was probably the first, you know, love of like, because because it was on the radio, you know what I mean? I remember hearing all that stuff. When Bohemian Rhapsody came out, I remember being in the station wagon with my mom, like going to the store or whatever, and that song coming on and just being like, wow, you know, Um but I remember one of the first cassette tapes I bought was David Bowie live. Mm. And I cool. think it was, it was like a double album. It, it had everything on there, Suffrage and city and like just all the classics. And I remember getting super into that. And then I even had a little, I had a little group of friends. This is, this is so nerdy. It's like stranger things or something, but we had like an Elton John club. And we would get together and like play the records and stuff. And then we would have contests to like memorize the words to a song. And I remember one of them was Benny and the Jets. And like, nice. I probably still remember the words to Benny and the Jets to this day, because, you know, to be in the club, you got to know the words to Benny and the Jets wow. or whatever. So, you know, that stuff shaped me early. I remember hearing Meatloaf, Fat Out of Hell early. This was all uh, New Jersey, right? So my family moved to California when I was 15. So prior to that, it was all New Jersey. And um, I remember hearing Angel probably around the same time I heard Meatloaf. Kiss, of course, right? I remember my cousin Jody being at her house and I saw this kiss alive and I was just like, whoa, that's fucking Here we cool, go. you know? Um, and <laughs> then the same reaction. It's funny. The, the clincher, like the last clincher, um, and this was probably when I was 14 or 15 already. My cousin Dave, my dad's sister's son, um, who was who was a rocker and always playing acoustic guitar at, you know family parties and whatever. And um, he bought me and my brother for Christmas one year. He bought my brother um, Aerosmith, get your wings. Mm. And he bought me fog hat of fog hat live. Oh, wow. And every song. And, on and I remember at the time, my brother was like all about Chicago. So like he put it on and he was just like, <laughs> you can have it. And I was like, yeah, I'll take it. And I fucking burned those vinyls over and over and over and over man um and get your wings still to this day is my favorite aerosmith record nice wow. it's kind You're of a weird alone. one for some people but yeah. like 
seasons of wither yeah. like there's some songs some deep tracks on there that still i get chills when i listen to and fucking fog had yo my drown wheel oh, and all so that good. Like, i didn't even uh, probably every, every know song what slide that, guitar was but it sounded that's like amazing a, that's like a greatest hits for fog hat yeah, every exactly. song on there yep. just kicks so much ass jason jason is your new best friend as soon as you mentioned elton john you got, hey, jason, you're, you're speaking you you're speaking his language yeah. jason so we played together. I was going to ask if you guys had ever crossed no, paths before. We did. Jet Boy and Danger but, but I don't know if you remember this, but we played with you. I don't remember where it was. Maybe Texas. Fort Worth. You, you guys had that bus. Fort Worth. I think you had just like gotten that thing revamped and whatever. Um, and uh, it was with broken teeth, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to bring up a... a a downer topic but wasn't that the the night that we found out uh tracy michaels from peppermint creeps died because they had played that night too somewhere else and i remember the I, club that we played at uh -huh. we fucking shot we shut that place down and we hung out with the owner like in the back and we were just drinking all night i, I remember it yeah it really fucked up that night yeah that's that would be warren garza yeah mm -hmm. right it yeah. was it was off the chain like you know but the 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 buddy mentioned that you heard passed away i don't recall that part of the story yeah well it might have been like we found out the next day or whatever uh, but, yeah. but he I, was in a band called the peppermint creeps yeah, yeah i don't i don't and i'm unfamiliar I, I think with I've heard this. very very popular hollywood guy like okay. i went to his funeral at the forever uh cemetery in, in in hollywood there and it was a huge turnout and he was a really liked guy and just got too fucked up and did some pills or something and od but uh i remember just kind of like going fuck man because i mean that was a great show like i remember like you were fucking on point you know and i remember uh being pretty lit up when i got on stage which but like the perfect level so you just like fill <laughs> in and you just had a great show and just super rad well you just had gas, that, in, you had gas in the tank buddy yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> gas and then the after tank. that i just remember like that guy just like closing up the fucking building and we went like in a back lounge and it was just like whatever you guys want yeah that sounds like warren garza to me yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got a place in fort worth now called the rail club okay and we just did a couple of shows in December, we went through there with Junkyard. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. we played so, with Junkyard a couple times yeah. before the pandemic. Uh, awesome. And then I saw them. They came here to Vegas uh, the first year that, that we moved here. And I went, I, my brother was in town, and we went out to see Junkyard and hung out with them backstage and stuff. And fucking love those guys, man. Yeah, I don't know how permanent it is, but David lives right next door to me right now. Like really? I'm, I'm pointing at David Roach right now. <laughs> He's literally on the wow. other side of this wall. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah. Hey, Mickey, oh. one, one more thing real quick, because this is very cool and kind of unusual. How did you guys get the phone call from the Philadelphia Flyers asking to use Feel Dude, the Shake? There was no phone call. What are you talking about? Did they just take it? They just, yeah, it? They just fucking used it, dude. Hell yeah. Like, wow. So, so for people so that aren't. We found out after when people started telling us like, Hey, you know, you guys are using you when they score a goal or whatever. Like what? You know, eventually Billy did have communication with, with the guy who was responsible. And it, it, it's the same story every time. Like somebody who was an old jet boy fan and was in a position to like, Hey, let's, you know, do this. Um, there's no money in case anyone was wondering, <laughs> there's no payout to us. <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, that's still I mean, pretty cool. Yeah, it's, oh, just, fuck yeah, dude. And I'm yeah, from Jersey, cool. so, like, I was into hockey when I was a kid, and yeah. I was into the Rangers and the Flyers and, like, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. My my dad's side of the family is from Philadelphia, so I grew up on the Sixers, the Flyers, the Phillies, and all that yeah. stuff. So All that. Giants, when Jets. That, when I heard that uh, Feel the Shake was the was the goal yeah. song for the Flyers, I thought that was pretty dude, cool. I, God, that, that song could be used for so many things, right? Even like oh, yeah. for years we've been saying, fuck, why doesn't Chevy take the heavy Chevy song and edit that for a fucking commercial, you know? Born to Fly is another commercial yeah. waiting to happen. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, <laughs> that's a tough nut to crack, man. That whole licensing thing, because they do pick unheard of random tracks, you know, but like 
how, how do you, you know, either, either it's a band everybody knows or a band no one knows. And then right. after that commercial comes out now, everyone knows the band. So I would love something like that to happen, but you know, we're trying to regroup right now uh, in closing where, yes. where we're at today, obviously Billy's in Buck Cherry now. So he's very busy. He also has an amazing guitar company called rock and roll relics yep. that is growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, but but Billy's heart will always be with Jet Boy. We have agreed together. We will always try to do it whenever we can, uh, as long as we can. Fernie, unfortunately, has thrown in the towel and has officially retired. Uh, we didn't make any big announcement or anything, but, you know, uh, he, he he's out. Um, and we're right now, you know, getting ready to, to bring somebody new into the band to fill Fern's shoes. We do have a cover album we were ever slowly working on for Cleopatra. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they're starting to go like, hey, guys, you know, shit or get off the pot. So uh, I really hope that, you know, in the remainder of this year, we can regroup, finish this cover record. And then we, we, we do have a couple offers. Um that I'd love to get back on stage again. So I'm confident we will. It's just a matter of when and where, you know? Yeah. Sure. Well, we hope you do the same because, uh, you know, Jet Boy was one of those much loved bands that never quite had the tour support to go out and do a year and a half run and hit every city in America. So when you do get together, even if it's many years later, there's people waiting for it. And, uh, I know that when I saw you at South Texas Rock Fest, that was a blast and something yeah. I thought I'd never see, and it was great. Yeah. And uh, so, we went yeah. To the UK too, uh, at the end of Born to Fly before the pandemic, we were actually scheduled to go back to the UK to play that Hard Rock Hell festival again. Um, but then the pandemic came and fucked everything up. And um, but but that that was super rad to go to UK and you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. First time for me to be there with Jet Boy and and uh, you know the yeah. rock, the uh, the um, the cruise the Monsters of Rock cruise God that was so fun too and I just saw so many people and met so many people and would, would love to do that again too. Yeah, so, those things are kind of saving rock and roll for the yeah, the, right. the ilk of band that didn't quite sell enough records but still had the following. Yeah, where you can do one of those cruises like every year or every other year and see all your old ill can play all yeah. your old songs and there's like that's why they're keeps they're keeps being more and more of them right yeah like, yeah there's there's cruise, you know you, you're not going cruise. anywhere you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean and there's you know it could be up to between five hundred and a thousand people watching you play yeah. these songs you wrote when you were a, kid. a flogging Molly cruise. Wow. And it was like Flongy Molly and all these cool punk rock bands. And then they had skateboarders like my old friend Steve Caballero was there. They had skateboard ramps and like punk rock bands and shit. And it's like, Rad. fuck yeah, man. Like That's cool. Because yeah. you know they have a pipe on the on the deck. Yeah, they had the yeah. pipe there, yeah. dude. Like, had on the deck in the middle of the board. ocean. That's, that's a great fun. idea, man. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Well, Mickey, we don't want to be responsible for your kids starving tonight. Yeah, so, right. uh, I, I actually left my son at, at my neighbors across the street. Um, <laughs> my buddy, Alan, I give a shout out to my buddy, Alan. Uh, nice. He is uh, 70 years old. He's got hair down to here, gray hair. We call him the wizard. Nice. And his grandson goes to the same school as, uh, as my son. So we walk the kids to school and then have a beer and chill. And Cheers uh, to the wizard. Yeah. The wizard is watching my boy right now. He came through for me. So <laughs> yeah, the wizard is watching. Yeah, the well, wizard extend, is watching. extend our is watching. thanks to the extend our thanks to the wizard as well for yes. freeing you up a little bit to join us today. Yeah, uh, we right do on. appreciate your time. On behalf of my co-host Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave, along with our special guest today, Mickey Finn from Jet Boy Cold Blue Rebels, here on the Talk Louder podcast. Right on, guys. 